about it as a late breaking substitution for Kathleen who woke up with a bad throat this morning. Uh, the reading is from Matthew chapter 21 verses 23 to 32. Then he was back in the temple teaching. The high priests and the leaders of the people came up and demanded, Show us your credentials. Who authorized you to teach here? Jesus responded, First let me ask you a question. You answer my question and I will answer yours. About the baptism of John, you authorized it. Heaven or humans? They were on the spot and knew it. They pulled back into a huddle and whispered, If we say heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe him. If we say humans, we're up against it with the people because they all hold John as a prophet. They decided to concede that round to Jesus. We don't know, they answered. Jesus said, then neither will I answer your question. Tell me what you think of this story. A man had two sons. He went up to the first and said, Son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. The son answered, I don't want to. Later on, he thought better of it and went. The father gave the same command to the second son. He answered, Sure, glad to. But he never went. Which of the two sons did what the father had asked? They said, The first. Jesus said, Yes, and I tell you that crooks and wars are going to precede you into God's kingdom. John came to you, showing you the right road. You've turned up your noses at him, but the crooks and the horse believed him. Even when you saw their changed lives, you didn't care enough to change and believe him. This is God's word.
Because these people had already made up their mind that he could not be from God. Our gospel story takes place in the temple. Now, the previous day of this one, Jesus entered the city on the uh, unrestrained face of the people. And what did he do? He promptly heads to the temple, the center of Jewish religious life. Who's, and he overturned the tables of money changers and cleaned out the place. A full frontal assault on everything sacred to the understanding of the Jews of the worship and faith in God. So he literally and symbolically overturned the system. He was telling him, I'm going to turn, overturn everything that you hold dear and sacred. It's going. That's, that's a good entry, I think. Now, he reappears the next day teaching in the temple. <laughs> and those in charge of the facility, still reeling from the outrageous spectacle of the previous day, are in no mood to be warm and fuzzy with this countryside rabbi. They've had enough. They confront him and his authority, his authority directly. Show us your credentials. By what authority are you doing all these things, they ask. Well, that's a good and decent question. I think it's appropriate. Why? Like you waltz into the temple and you throw everything into chaos and now you're teaching something at odds with our authorized version of truth and expect us to support you? Well, there's no question in Jesus' day that those who confronted him, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, these were God's representatives on earth. These were the people in highest authority. And so obviously Jesus' presence and his behavior and his teachings were a direct threat to them to their power, to their status, to their security, to their influence. Well, that stuff hasn't stopped since. The question of authority goes right to the heart of the gospel, right to the heart of our society. Now, in the Middle Ages, we also knew who had authority, the church. There wasn't any crisis at that time. God was the unquestioned source of authority, and the church authorities on earth were the earthly agents who wielded unquestionable influence and control. But then came the Reformation, and things shifted. Authority shifted from institutions and individuals like the Pope to the Bible, which some people call the paper Pope for Protestants. What is, but as soon as that happened, what was intended to unite believers around a fixed, unchanging, even infallible point of authority? had the opposite effect, right? Because with growing literacy and the invention of the printing press, <laughs> now everybody could have a Bible who had, wasn't interpreted by, you know, the priest or the one authority figure anymore. Everybody could read it for themselves and then everybody could interpret it as they saw it. And that is what happened. Yeah. And they often came up with drastically different conclusions <laughs> about what scripture meant. Uh, so, authority was not so much in the Bible as a book as in the interpreters of the Bible. And that hasn't stopped. And then there's the development of Protestant denominations, which all formed because people took different interpretations of certain texts. And here we are. Here we are. There were many divided sources of authority. And it's been that way since. The old consensus over authority is gone. Then we entered the period known as the Age of Enlightenment or Reason. And there it was discovered or thought that authority doesn't lie in some ancient document or venerable institutions, but it lies in the heart of every individual. Every person has the freedom to be their own authority. All truth and authority was seen as relative. And you had the right to speak your truth. And people still use that <laughs> phrase today. I'm speaking my truth. Our age, the church, uh, used to occupy a venerable position in our culture. You, know, you can all remember that, right? If you grew up in the, uh, in the Christian era. The church influenced decision making at the highest levels of government and formed and reinforced socially accepted moral behavior. And that's gone. No more. No more. We don't have that authority any longer. Pastors and church leaders used to have trust and authority imputed to them by their office. You didn't have to earn it. That's a thing of the past. You know, I, I had a member of the board some years ago. Some of you who are on the board know who this is. A member of the board who joined the board because he wanted to be the, 
he wanted to be a watchdog. He wanted to watch me. He wanted to keep a leash on me, keep me restrained to some. And during the meetings, he'd sit there with his Bible open and just when certain things were said, he'd thumb through as though he were looking for some scriptural argument. Well, show us your credentials. Who authorized you to teach here? Jesus is asked. But he never answers the question. This is scene one. This is scene one in our, in our story today. He never answers the question, does he? He chooses to ask a question of his own. He often did that. Second scene opens. So he turns it to the subject of John, John's baptism of repentance in the desert. And he says, who authorized that? He said, who authorized that? If you're going to talk about where authority is, who's in charge, was it heaven or humans? We heard that when we read it. And they were caught. They were stuck. They were in a crisis because, as you heard, John was popular. He had a large following of people. Many thought he was the expected Messiah. He, he denied that. But they believed him. They believed his message of repentance. And they followed it up with baptism as a sign of turning from their sin and pledging to live a new life. And they did. Well, they couldn't say that it was from heaven. Because if they did, <laughs> they have to answer the question, well, why didn't you believe him? And get baptized. Well, they didn't think they needed to be baptized because they had nothing to repent from, right? They didn't need to change their lives. Why be baptized? Well, if you say heaven, that's not going to work. Because they say, why didn't you do it? And if you say it's human, the people held John as a prophet. And they could have some really big troubles on their hands. So they said, we don't know. We don't know. Now it's fascinating when you read that. Those who represented God's authority couldn't refute John's authority, and by implication, couldn't refute Jesus' authority, because John was the one who prepared the way for Jesus, you see. Where does authority lie? Who's in charge here? Who's in charge? Well, awkward moment. And what it means is all, all bets are off as to where authority is to be found. I ask, what authority does Jesus have in your life? And where does his authority come from to answer the question we should answer? Now, people know there's basically two forms of authority in the world today. There's the authority of force, and there's the authority of function. Let me explain. I think the first one is pretty obvious. First form of authority is really about power. It's about control and coercion. Those in authority command compliance by threats of force. Like the religious leaders here in Jesus' day. If you did not keep the law, you could be faced with some really evil consequences, bad consequences for you. And, uh, so, we think of authorities in our world today, like police, lives. we think of authority figures who rule by force, have authority by the that means. Second, it's not about, less about naked power and more about effectiveness. When someone lists a load of degrees after their name or a resume full of impressive credentials, they're not using coercion. They're just telling you they know how to run things, they know how to make things work, they know how to get the best out of people, and then they go ahead and do it. They get results, they're effective in their functions, and people respect their authority. What kind of authority does Jesus have? Does he have one or the other of these? Now we could say God's authority is coercive. We could. God made all of creation. God gives us life. God determines the moment of death. God holds before us the possibility of eternal life. That's power. That's power. And the church has often used that. If we take that line, then Jesus' authority is authority of force, of power. Look at his miracles. Look at the things he did for other people. Or we can say Christianity uh, has authority because it basically works. You, know, you do what Jesus taught, and it, and it works. So we give him authority. But maybe there's a third kind of authority that isn't either one of these. Let's think about this as we come to the end of here today. 
This goes beyond, authority goes beyond force and function. It sometimes appears weak and even unpopular, but it abides whether people follow it or not. There's no need of manipulation with this type of authority. It's simplicity, it's transparency, it's generosity, it's beauty. And that authority is truth. That authority is truth. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And that's pretty definitive, I would say. All authority. Believe in me, not because you have to, not because it works, but because in me you come face to face with the truth. It's the real deal. It's the real deal. There's nothing more fundamental than Jesus for us as Christians and what God is doing in Jesus. That's where the authority is. That's what it means. His words and his works were always congruent with one another. Always. See? And the truth of Jesus was sacrificial love, unconditional love and service. Sacrificial service. We say he's the way, the truth, and the life. You, know? you get on the way, you discover the truth, and you get a life. That's what he offers. That's what it's about for us. The implications of discerning Jesus as the way, the truth, and sharing his life um, is what we think authority is all about. That's why we do it. And then he tells this story, third scene, with these two boys. As if to demonstrate what he's just said, as if to elaborate on the fact that he is the one with authority. Um, now the two sons are very different, aren't they? One always said yes to the father. Uh, in fact, whenever the father was around, he always said what he thought the father didn't want to hear. Right? And kids will do that. But he never did anything the father asked. The other, he didn't, in other words, he never respected the authority of his father. He put on a good show. The other one is a little rebellious. He's not very religious in his speech. In fact, he's uncomfortable with re re religious talk and religious people. And he's the one of these kids who's always asking, Why? Why? Right? You know that type? <laughs> it's always challenging the authority a bit. You know. And sometimes he'd say no, as kids are wanting to do too. No, but finally he would do what the father asked. And Jesus said, which one obeyed the Father? Well, he said, the one who did what the Father asked. Oh, yeah. That's what it's about, isn't it? That's right, boys, and here's the deal. Crooks and the whores will go to heaven before you do. Imagine saying that to the authorities. <laughs> you're, all, you're a sorry lot, he says. You're all show and no go. But these guys heard John's message and they opened their hearts and they repented and they, bat they were baptized and their lives were changed and you've seen that now they're doing what God's called them to do whoa implying what you are not you are not doing what God wants you to do that morning as Jesus was on his way to the temple to teach he passed a fig tree and he noticed that the fig tree had no fruit on it he cursed it remember that just before he got in the temple and had this little row with the priests and elders. And why did he do that? Because a fig tree exists to bear figs. And God's people exist to bear fruit in serving God. Wow. Well, you know, even if people don't know they're serving God, God can still be blessed and honored, I believe. Uh, I reconnected with a family that used to be long-standing members here with uh, with the son of a woman who I knew and did her funeral some years ago. Um, and uh, I asked how his sister was doing, because she, this fellow's sister, uh, they used to attend here when their children were young, but they're not really churchgoers, you know, they're not religious in any way really. But for decades this woman, my friend's sister, has worked as a lawyer in the Northwest Territories among First Nations people. She is the one who, got, who as a lawyer, um, 
wrote up the, uh, the papers for the rights to give rights to the Dene people to get their land back. Now she works on environmental causes with oil companies and Aboriginal peoples. Win-win. Win-win. With such passion and dedication and compassion for these people. This is kingdom stuff she's doing. Kingdom stuff. Though she would never call it that. She would never recognize it as that. But she is doing what God has asked her to do. Even though she may not confess him. Right? It's like the son. God's not interested in our confessions of who he is. Lord, Lord. Jesus said, many will call me Lord, Lord. But I don't recognize them. Why? Because they don't do what I would do. I know what God has called them to do. Now, she is doing what God has asked them to do. With compassion, grace, dedication, sacrifice. Right? Our partnerships as a church with other agencies and groups are not necessarily Christian. But we work with people whose values we share broadly, wherever we find them, who care for the soul of the city, and we'll work together for its welfare and well-being. Even if they don't acknowledge God, we see that they're doing the work of God in a long way. This week, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of Cups. And uh, this church was pivotal in the beginning. It wouldn't have happened without the initiative here. 25 years, and there will be a celebration this week uh, that I'll be attending. I think about that, how we came into being. Is Cups Christian anymore? No, it's a grown Christian. It, it was when it started, but it's bigger than it's for all people and it's represented by all people. Right? They're doing the work that God has called them to do. Uh, in the parable, the father is pleased with the son who gives, who first blows him off, but still ends up doing what pleased him. That's what matters here. Listen, the good news is for crooks and whores. <laughs> Those are most abhorred and abandoned in Jesus' day. It's certainly got to be good news for us. For all of us who have said no to God in our lives, whether it's out of selfishness, stubbornness, fear, doubt, you name it. But in the story, the amazing thing is that the Father allows room for complaining, for ver verbal resistance, for outright refusal to do what He has authority to ask. But he's not punitive with either son. He's simply trying to invite him to join in His work of the vineyard. That's it. That's what he's doing. And the vineyard represents the kingdom of God. It brings him pleasure and will ultimately be most pleasing to us and others to get on board with that. And so today, wherever you've been, even in a far land, you can begin the back track to God's domain and we can say yes. Yes, Father. We recognize your authority to ask us to go and to be at work in the kingdom of God. And we can offer our hands, our hearts, and our spirit to that great work. Let us pray. Gracious loving God, we read this story, we hear it, and we, we believe we know where authority is in the world today, that ultimately I'm always at rest with you, and you have given your son, Jesus, authority over all things, and we acknowledge his authority. His right to declare that in our lives, in our churches, in our cities, in our country. We want to, we want to be obedient. We want to be faithful servants. We don't want to just be nice people who say all the right things about you, believe all the right things about you, and think that's all that's required. You don't care what we think necessarily all the time about you. You don't care so much what we confess about you. What you're really after is to get us into the vineyard, to get us into the work of your kingdom, which encompasses all things, and is growing silently, quietly, um, in small ways like a seed, but growing nonetheless because Jesus has sown it. And we want to be the good soil in which it continues to take root and grow, and then to share it with one another and beyond, with those beyond. The ones Jesus 
said so we'd get to heaven before the good people, before the righteous people. So give us hearts for them as Jesus had, for the least and the last and the lost among us. And in that way we will rejoice. We will rejoice and we will be blessed and we will be filled with all your wondrous treasures that you have for us. We will be more than we could ever imagine if we just sit on the sidelines and say, I'll go and then don't do it. So help us to take those steps this week with every person we meet to see them and see it as an opportunity to share the good news and to act out the good news in their lives as you have in ours and continue to do. We ask it in your name. Amen. Well, you know much younger than today because you've been good kids. <laughs>